Hey there, welcome to another episode of Brand Mavericks, the podcast that ignites your entrepreneurial spirit and guides you on a path to building your own franchise empire. I'm Neil DiPantino from Titan Media Works. I'm your host for today's show. And today we're honored to have Kurt Meyer, the Vice President of Business Development at IBA International Business Associates, a Pacific Northwest business brokerage firm with a rich 45 year history. Joining, join me in welcoming Kurt Meyer to the show. Kurt, welcome to the show, buddy. Well, thank you, Neil. It's a pleasure being here today. Well, I mean, it's my pleasure, actually. We've been having a really kind of fun conversation offline and learning a little bit about each other. You're up there in Seattle, um, which I, I don't know if I told you this, but I've had, I used to actually be a, a, a regional manager for a company that's based here in Nashville. And part of my territory was Seattle. We had an office in Kent. Terrific. We've been here about 17 years and we love it. Well, fantastic. Well, all kinds of things going on in the world of franchising and business brokerage, and we're going to jump right into all that stuff. But before we do, uh, hey, tell us a little bit about yourself and, uh, and, and who you are. Sure, Neil. So I'm a Chicago native, uh, grew up in New Jersey, graduated from high school there, went to school in the Midwest uh, at a football power, Notre Dame. Uh, after graduation, I entered the United States Navy as a naval nuclear submarine officer. I was based in Pearl Harbor. My ship was actually moored in Guam. It was a fleet ballistic missile submarine. So I would do three month patrols off the coast of Russia in the height of the Cold War in the early 1980s. Um, after my initial five year stint in the Navy, I decided that I wanted to go into the real world. And in those days, in the mid 80s, uh, you would go to the biggest, baddest headhunter you could find and try to get a job in a Fortune 500 company, because that's what you did back then, 40 some years ago. Mm -hmm. And so I found my way to a Fortune 300 chemical company by the name of Air Products and Chemicals. And I worked in their industrial gas division for 20 years. I started in the field in sales, moved to branch management was a country manager in Malaysia. So I was an expat for a couple of years, came back to the corporate headquarters, which was in Allentown, Pennsylvania, where I had a series of uh, increasingly challenging jobs, uh, one of which was managing the global helium business for our products. They control 40% of the world's helium production and supply. After that assignment, I had my last one with Air Products, which was in the North American healthcare business, which is where I got my merger and ap acquisition chops. We had decided to enter the market and start acquiring respiratory therapy, durable medical equipment, and infusion therapy companies. And uh, after I made a $165 million acquisition of a regional firm, uh, we had acquired the M&A capability in that acquisition, and it enabled me to wrangle an early retirement package at the age of 46 after 20 years service, uh, nice. which enabled me to become an entrepreneur. So I think of myself as the reluctant entrepreneur in that I pictured myself working for Air Products till I was 65, retire and drop dead, right? But uh, my wife is a professional as well, CPA by training. Uh, master in tax, started with KPMG and then went, went into private industry. And I thought she would stay at home with our two daughters who came along. And uh, she encouraged me to do something entrepreneurial and take control of our life. And it really makes no sense, Neil, to have two working spouses as W-2 employees. It makes no sense. Mm -hmm. uh, when one is an entrepreneur, think of the tax benefits, that you have, you know, the ability to write off discretionary spend and such. You know, the one spouse has the W-2, nails down the compensation and benefits, and it enables the spouse to take the risk. And there was a risk in me leaving a comfortable corporate career after 20 years. And uh, when I did leave the company, I had to find out what I wanted to do. I wanted to run a business. I wanted to run a small business. So, First thing I did, and I, and I do this with uh, clients right now to this very day, so uh, it's a good story to share. Uh, so I sought out to buy an existing business, an existing cash flow. I wanted to, my goal was to replace my corporate income as soon as I could, and buy something that I could uh, grow. And for me, the most important thing was flexibility. I did not want to 
um, be bound to open and close a business every day from eight to five. I wanted the flexibility to uh, take care of my two girls that were growing and allow my wife to be the corporate player. So flexibility was important to me. I wanted a business that I eventually could become an absentee owner, replace my corporate income and potentially replicate. Um, after looking at several businesses in the Lehigh Valley, Eastern Pennsylvania, um, I, I, I got frustrated. Uh, I kept finding things wrong with every opportunity I looked at. And so one day I had lunch with a, a former division controller at Air Products and he said, how's the search going? Have you found something to buy? You know, certainly don't start anything from scratch because that's destined for failure. So I said, well, yeah, you know, I, I'm looking at this business and uh, I'm concerned all the employees are going to leave day one. And then I'm looking at this business, but I'm concerned the market's going to change. And I'm looking at this one and he, and he interrupts me and he says, you know, what the are you looking for? I said, well, Jesus, this is my money. This is my investment. This isn't the corporations. OK, uh, I'm not looking for a turnaround situation. OK, I'm a conservative, risk averse guy. You know, in the Navy, I ran a nuclear reactor plant. I was responsible for 16 Polaris A3 missiles. So, you know, I'm conservative in nature. And so with my own business, I don't want to buy something unless I know it can perform. And he goes, well, it sounds like you're looking for perfection. I said, you're goddamn right I am. And he said, is that so? And I said, yes. And I have the time to do it. And I have the money to buy something that's solid. And he said, uh, your wife, Lynn, she perfect? Excuse me? She perfect in all the different categories that you look for in a wife? And I said, well, you know, nobody is perfect. He goes, well, that's my point. You're looking for something that doesn't exist. There is no perfect business out there for you. Right. So you're going to frustrate yourself. And so I looked at him and I said, well, did I make a mistake leaving, you know, the comfort of working in a in a corporate role where you've got support from every every area? And he said, no. He said, but you have to realize what you are. I said, well, what am I? He goes, you're an executor. Excuse me? You execute. Think about it. In the Navy, you were given various jobs and you executed. In the corporation, you had position descriptions for every job you had, whether it was sales, branch management, country management, general management, and you executed. Air products didn't need you to be innovative. They were in an oligopoly with very few competitors. They had capital barriers to entry. They had technology barriers to entry. So they just needed you to execute and you did it well. So why don't you use that skill and shift your search from just existing businesses to franchises? So he said, franchises. And I looked at him and I said, franchises? <laughs> you remember the football coach, Mora? Playoffs? Yeah. Playoffs? <laughs> that was the first thing I thought of. Absolutely. So I, I said, franchises. I said, you know, franchises are for somebody who needs help, you know, that doesn't know what they're doing, you know, and uh, I don't need that. I mean, I've run quarter billion dollar global businesses. I don't need somebody telling me what to do. And, uh, you know, paying royalties in perpetuity for what? And he said, well, that's interesting. He said, in your corporate P&L, you know, he's a division controller. He said, uh, I recall that you paid an indirect overhead fee to the corporation for the cost of capital, for corporate lawyers, for corporate PR. He said, that's the same as a royalty. It's <laughs> something you're going to have to replicate anyway. So why not? you know, pay a royalty, which is going to be fixed, by the way, for the duration mm -hmm. of your agreement term. And you decide if there's enough value there. If not, kick them to the curb, move to another franchise concept that you're comfortable with. So I credit him for opening my eyes to franchising. I mean, frankly, like a lot of listeners out there right now, when they hear franchising for the first time, they're thinking McDonald's, you know, Jimmy John's, Jersey Mike's, you know, um, there are so many franchise opportunities in so many industries. I mean, there's there's four to five thousand concepts and there's new ones coming up daily. Mm -hmm. um, and again, being risk averse, conservative, as I started looking at franchises, I only focused on blue chip ones. 
I didn't mm-hmm. want to be some guinea pig, quite frankly. I wanted to make sure I was going to make money and I wanted to have an idea of when I was going to make it, when I was going to reach break even, when I was going to replace my corporate uh, income. I wanted to have an exit strategy so that, you know, six to 10 years down the line, I could potentially sell it if I wanted to, maybe invest in something else, because at that point I would be comfortable being a small business owner. But this is my first rodeo. And franchises are perfect for people that are leaving the corporate environment and, you know, find themselves in business for themselves, but not by themselves. I think I like the the analogy that you gave as far as the, you know, the the legal part of it, because I think a lot of times when you're trying to start something from scratch, um, you don't realize, I mean, you have all these great ideas and everything, and maybe you have a uh, a product or, an, or, or something that you want to bring to market and you think it's the greatest thing since, you know, uh, uh, sliced bread. Uh, but, and, and it might be, but there's so many other things that are involved in business in general that, um, that you don't know about for the most part. And where franchising comes in is they kind of take those things off of your plate, like the, like the, uh, working with the legal department, that type of thing. There's even more, there's the marketing, there's finance, there's all kinds of things that franchise franchisors bring to the table. If you pick the right one. Oh, exactly right. I mean, I, I look at the market here in uh, in Seattle and next to Silicon Valley. I mean, there's a lot of startup activity, particularly in technology, and um, it's fraught with failure. I mean, one of the one of the side ventures that uh, that I participate in is as an angel investor, and so you know, I'm sitting through these Shark Tank sessions, realizing that at the end of the day, nine out of ten of these startups are going to fail. It's just the mm-hmm. way it is. Uh, whereas with franchising, it's reversed. You know, more than ninety percent of them are going to be successful. So why is that? It's because it's a proven business model, and it's been refined, right. and it's been enhanced. And the good franchisors are around for many years for that reason. They reinvest right. in the franchise. They don't. Right. You know, there are exceptions of private equity coming in and just kind of uh, looking at it as a. Uh, a way of uh, increasing value and flipping. But for the most part, the, the top franchisors are going to be there for, for you as a franchisee. And, right. so. and they've already they've already made all the mistakes that you would make as a startup. They've already gone through all that. They've they've you know, they've made the mistakes. They found the solutions. And now you're walking into a situation where you can actually just, you know, for the most part, if you're you, know, you have to run the business. Obviously, it's not something you just walk into and, uh, you know, it's going to take care of itself. There's work that's involved with it as an owner. Uh, but a lot of the work that you would have had to done as a as a, an independent getting started uh, is already taken care of for you or it's taken care of for you for you on, on a day-to-day week-to-week year-to-year basis exactly so so now you can see that uh, after this lunch i had a lot to think about he basically my friend basically opened my eyes to franchising so i shifted my search from solely existing businesses to franchises now the the challenge i had and i didn't realize it at the time is that i did this all on my own this is 2004 2005 And so I would go to the internet like a lot of people do right now. And I'd Google, I want to buy a franchise, you know, what's good, blah, blah. And I would look across industries, et cetera. I did not realize then that franchise consultants, franchise brokers existed and they Mm -hmm. exist for the purpose of guiding you through this process because they've been there, done that. They understand the good franchises. They understand what territories are open. They do a wonderful job of assessing your skills, your strengths, your weaknesses. You know, when you find the fit, right? So I did this all on my own. And I looked at franchises in all industries. I'm talking automotive, food, staffing, painting. And the one that I liked the most was senior health care. And what attracted me to that? Well, you know, the last job I had in the corporate world was in healthcare. So I understood private pay versus Medicare, Medicaid. And I saw many, many uh, franchises in the in home non medical space growing at the time. These would be the home insteads and visiting angels, et cetera. And uh, very little capital required for those businesses. These are service businesses, but profitable right? Mm -hmm. And scalable. Mm -hmm. 
And I came across one, a concept that I hadn't even heard of. I had not heard of adult daycare. And I dare say that many of your listeners right now don't know what day, adult daycare is 20 years no. later. Mm-hmm. Okay. I never heard of it. No. And what adult daycare is, was, is, is an alternative to in-home care. So picture mm-hmm. if you're a spouse with a, an older, uh, an older husband or wife. So, you know, you're 80 years old and your husband or wife is 85. You want to age in place. You want to age until, you know, you can't be independent anymore. Well, right. the way the way you do that, whether you're living with a spouse or the more common scenario is a baby boomer having their older adult live with them. Well, in order to provide care for them in the home, you've got to bring these firms in, you know, in-home non-medical companionship. Mm-hmm. And that costs, you know, 20, 25 bucks an hour for, you know, two hours, four hours, eight hours a day. An alternative to that is to have the older adult who has some degree of cognitive or physical impairment picture somebody that is, you know, they're not ready for the assisted living facility or the nursing home, but they need some care. You know, they might Mm -hmm. have some dementia. They might, uh, you know, need a reminder to take meds or whatever. So an adult daycare center is a bricks and mortar investment. My facility was uh, 6,000 feet and uh, you have a staff of uh, several salaried individuals, you know, a director, a nurse and an activity director. And then everybody else are providing the care for the participants, as we call them. So they get dropped off at, you know, six, seven, eight o'clock in the morning. They spend the day there and then they go home. So there's no overnight care. That's why it's adult daycare. And during the day, there are social activities, physical activities, meals. I mean, it's a wonderful atmosphere. I mean, at the end of the day, human beings are are social beings. Some are more Mm -hmm. introverted than others. Some, like myself, a bit more extroverted. But at the end of the day, they like being with each other. And it's a very healthy environment. And from a cost standpoint, you can pay 80 to 100 bucks to have your older adults in an adult daycare. Whereas, you know, if you're bringing somebody into the home for 25 bucks an hour, it's more expensive. So yeah, adult daycare model, it makes sense. And uh, the way it's paid for uh, is in a couple different ways. Now, when you get the in-home non-medical care through franchises or independent businesses, that's all private pay. There are programs, Medicaid, There are VA programs through the Veterans Administration that will pay for adult daycare. So I had families coming in there paying me privately uh, through Medicaid and through the VA. So it was a really solid business model, recurring revenue. Mm -hmm. Um, It was just fabulous. The profitability was great. So I grew that business. Uh, you know, and the franchisor helped me negotiate the initial lease. They helped me hire the initial employees. Um, they provided marketing support, all the things you were talking about, you know, that you get from a franchise. Mm-hmm. And uh, that business grew and, uh, you know, it took a while to reach break even. And like every franchisee, you know, you're wondering how long you have to kick that, uh, you know, credit line to be able to make payroll. But once you reach break even, then there was the hockey stick curve. And before you knew it, I replaced my corporate income. Hmm. I own my own business. And I made enough money to where I could pay a manager a reasonable salary to where I could be absentee. I love that. And I had the potential to open multiple sites because I signed an area development agreement and I locked down the territory in eastern Pennsylvania. Pretty good story. So meanwhile, my wife is the corporate player and um, it enabled me the flexibility I was seeking to take my kids, you know, they went to private school, they went to violin lessons, I'm taking them to swimming, you know, practices and meets. So I'm getting the flexibility I wanted by being a franchisee. And I didn't have any risk because I knew I was going to be successful. So I was very pleased that I bought a franchise. Um, Just to finish that story, I grew that business, uh, you know, from opening in late 2005, Uh, And then in 2007, my wife had a great opportunity to take a position here in Seattle. And because I was an absentee owner at the time, I said, let's go. Kids were in fourth and seventh grade. So we came here to Seattle. She took a job as a uh, VP of tax for a $10 billion global corporation. 
And I came here and I had the right measures and metrics in place in my business in Pennsylvania to where I could manage it from 3,000 miles away. No problem. You know, I would have conversations a few times a week, uh, some emails. I would travel back there on occasion more to visit my friends than <laughs> worry about the business because it was being run well because it was a good business model. Eventually, in 2011, I got some unsolicited interest in my business from a former uh, friend and employee of the company I worked for, Air Products, who ultimately bought the business from me because I wasn't going to grow it, you know, living in Seattle. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I had a decision to make. So this is 2011. And uh, I had to decide, what am I going to do next? So this process of selling my business to this individual was a fun one. So, uh, you know, he had asked me about the business. He had initially called me to, to uh, recommend him for another job in the industry. And I said, well, the heck with that. You should do what I did. And so I told him the same story I just relayed to you that, you know, uh -huh. take control of your life, find something that, you know, you enjoy and you're going to have a lot more fun. You're going to control your life. You're going to make a good buck. And so he started in this conversation, he started asking me about the business. Well, how do you manage it from 3000 miles away? You know, what does the franchise or do for you? Is there potential to grow by adding uh, additional centers? And before you know it, he was all lathered up and he said, Hey, why don't I just buy your business? And I said, well, I'm not looking to sell and you're not looking to buy. You're looking for a job. And the best way to sell or buy a business is when there's no pressure on either side, right? I'm not, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not forced to sell and he's not forced to buy. So I said, look, if we can work this out, um, I'd be more than happy to sell to you. You do a fine job. You have the same background as me and you're going to have the same success. Long and short of it is six months later, we closed. And during that period, I helped him um, get all of the licenses associated with adult daycare uh, transferred to him, assigned to him, transferred the lease to him, got him approved by the franchisor. I helped him with the funding of the business to buy me out. And I helped him uh, with the legal aspects of reviewing the franchise agreement and developing a purchase and sale agreement. So picture me flying out to Allentown in uh, October of, uh, I guess it was uh, October of uh, 2011. Uh, we met in my attorney's office, signed the papers. Uh, my agreement was terminated. He signed a new 10 year term and I was done. The next day I introduced him to staff. I didn't have to stay around for training because he had staff in place. Plus he a, has a franchisor behind him. So I flew back to um, to Seattle and on the plane ride home, it dawned on me. Oh, my God, it's done. Yeah. I've sold it. I've made it a good buck. So I've got money in hand and I had a great experience owning the business. So I was excited about my next chapter. And I don't know, I was 50 some years old at the time. And I said, well, what am I going to do next? And I was comfortable now being a small business owner. So I could either buy an existing business. I could start a new franchise. I could do whatever the I wanted to do. And so I thought, well, what do you want to do? What, what do you enjoy? And I really enjoyed selling my business. I enjoyed doing the valuation of it. I enjoyed the negotiation of it. I enjoyed helping the buyer get it done. And I recall the time that I left the corporation that I relayed to you when I looked to find a business. And so many people, Neil, here in the Seattle area are very sharp and they want to own their business, but they don't know how to go about it. So the typical clients we work with on the buy side would be, you know, folks from Microsoft, Amazon, Boeing, who want to get out of the corporate environment. They have plenty of money, but they don't know how to find the right business or franchise. So I'm mm -hmm. able to guide them through that process based on my own experience and share with them that, you know, you should consider both options, both the option of buying an existing business and, and a franchise. So I decided on that plane ride home uh, because remember, for the past six months, I was focused on getting the deal done. If I don't close that deal, all bets are off. Right. So I, I decided I wanted, I think I wanted to be a business broker. That seemed like a good thing to do. 
but I also like franchises. So I thought, well, why don't I do both? Why don't I sell businesses and franchises? So I came back to Seattle. I got my real estate broker's license, which enables me to be a business broker and work in mergers and acquisitions. I also got my franchise broker's license. Interestingly, there's only two states in the country that require a license to sell franchises. One and is you're in one of them. <laughs> in one of them, and the other is New York. Yeah. So um, then I decided, well, I don't know how to do business brokerage. I mean, it sounds good, but again, in order to do it well, I wanted to make sure I chose the right firm to um, affiliate with. Uh, I didn't want to start up from scratch. Again, getting back to our earlier discussion, don't start a business from scratch ever. I mean, <laughs> unless it's just such a unique thing and you're willing to take the risk. Right. Buy an existing business, buy a cash flow, and buy it so that it's a creative day one, or buy a new franchise, make the investment, make sure you're capitalized through break even until whatever income level you need. So mm -hmm. I came across Murphy Business Sales, which is one of the national business brokerage firms out there, fine firm. I mean, there are many of them, Murphy Business, Transworld, First Choice, Empire, VR, Sunbelt. There's all these national franchises in business brokerage, as well as franchise brokerage. Franchise brokerage uh, or and, yeah, franchise consulting has franchisors like the Entrepreneur Source, FranNet. FranNet is an outstanding um, franchise uh, for franchise consultants. Franchise, and then there are independent organizations for franchise broker. One of which is the Franchise Brokers Association, which I'm a member of, which is I believe mm -hmm. is the premier organization out there. There are others, uh, Business Alliance and IFPG, and uh, the Franchise Consulting Company and Franser. Um, again, I think the FBA. Uh, is superior based on the culture that they have, the inventory of franchisors, the quality of the education that they provide, new franchise consultants, the ongoing educational support to them, uh, their annual conference. I mean, um, I can go on and on and on about Franchise uh, uh, Brokers Association, and I would encourage mm -hmm. anybody who wants to consider franchise so let me can I can I just stop you right there just for a second? I mean, that's really all great information and everything. I hate to tell you this, but we are coming to the end of our time together. Uh, and this has all been wonderful. So basically, I guess to recap everything that you just said uh, is that you know you the the education that you received in, in in what you're doing today really was all firsthand, and and you are kind of like a. Uh, you're a broker and a franchise broker and a business broker. And it was not like on purpose, but more accidental uh, in, in some, in, in, in some cases. Right. So, uh, but it's actually been a really wonderful uh, career for you. And I think the things that you do and what you've done are, are things that can be replicated by pretty much anybody who has the interest in being in a franchise or owning their own business, being an entrepreneur, especially those people who are coming out of the corporate world and a lot of the military people. Uh, we just have a very short time, but I did want you to touch on your relationship with uh, with working with military people, people who have come out of the military looking to start business. Would you mind just touching on that just real quickly? Absolutely. So I'm, I'm blessed, as I mentioned to you, with having three distinct careers, you know, the military career, the corporate career and the entrepreneurship career. And uh, when I form my own business, my own business brokerage franchise, I decided I wanted to help veterans because um People coming out of the military um, have really very limited choices. They they need to find a job generally. I mean, they're they're relatively young folks. Um, they're typically going to end up as W two employees working for somebody. However, there is a segment of them. They could be senior officers. They could be senior enlisted that have the skill sets and the capability to be absolutely first rate small business owners. And I think the best franchisors recognize that. They recognize what I just, you know, shared with you that these folks are executors. They get it done. Mm -hmm. You know, they follow, you know, the recipe. So they're perfect for franchising. 
So what I do is I go to the bases, Joint Base Lewis McCord here, the Navy bases at Everett, at Puget Sound Naval Shipyard, at Sub Base Banger. And as these people are transitioning out of the military, I expose them to entrepreneurship. That really you have three choices. You can find a job, which 90% of you will do. You can get the GI Bill and take advantage of some education or whatever when you get out. Or you could do your own thing and start your own business or buy a franchise. And I'm here to tell you that that could be a great option for you and you ought to study it and you ought to work with us and our team to determine if that's the right fit for you. And we will either find you the right existing business or franchise, either here in Washington State, where you're currently living, or if you want to go back to your hometown and you want to franchise, we'll identify that and get things rolling so that when you transition out, you go directly to your hometown and you start that franchise. You know, it might be a, uh, you know, a pure clean. Uh, it might be, uh, you know, a fast signs. It might be, you know, any number of, of franchises. So I enjoy working with veterans. Um, I also expose them to the various funding uh, options that they have available to them as veterans. There are special SPA loans that are available to veterans and such, and certain companies cater to supporting them. And uh, mm -hmm. it's just a pleasure working with them because I am a veteran. And when I got out of the Navy in 84, I told you I went to a headhunter. They basically said, you know, just don't let the door hit you in the rear end on the way out. There was no support. There was no transition plan. Right. And if we don't take care of veterans, they're going to end up homeless, right? Or worse. And uh, so I enjoy that. Um, it's a lot of fun. Fantastic. And I appreciate what you're doing. I appreciate your service to our country. Um, listen, uh, I know there's people out there that are just dying to have a conversation with you to learn more about you, about your business, about the opportunities to be uh, to have their own franchise, to have their own business. How do they go about reaching out to you? Yeah. Uh, well, first off, I would encourage them to uh, approach me through LinkedIn. I'm, I'm glad to accept a, a connection to them. Um, I have um, a, a website, uh, KurtMMeyer.com, which takes you to my LinkedIn. Uh, the company I work for, you see in the background, IBA, uh, is a regional business brokerage firm where we represent sellers. But on our team, we have uh, experts in franchising to look at that option for you as well. Uh, I came to IBA, interestingly enough, after I had sold my franchise, my Murphy business franchise, I uh, thought I was done and uh, was was enticed to come back by the owner of IBA more in a business development capacity than as a deal maker right now. So I have the time mm -hmm. to be able to work with people and, uh, you know, tell them my experience and, and give them some suggestions on how to become a business broker if they want to be uh, and to consider the pros and cons of affiliating with a national firm or a local firm wherever you are. And then to, uh, again, as I touched on the uh, various associations for uh, franchise brokers and consultants, be more than happy to talk to them about the pros and cons of the various options out there. So uh, they'll find me, just uh, Google my name and uh, uh, they'll get a hold of me. Well, there you have it. Hey, I really appreciate you being on the show and sharing your expertise with us today. Okay, Neil. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, that's our show for today. So thrilled that you could be with us. Uh, hey, if you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. Uh, Brand Mavericks is sponsored by Titan Media Works, uh, providing podcast production and guest booking services for those who want to be in the podcasting space. Check us out at TitanMediaWorks.com. That's work spelled W-O-R-X. And also check out all the other great hosts on the Small Business Deliver Network at SmallBusinessDeliver.com. Hey, be sure to tune in for more Brand Mavericks coming soon. Until next time, keep building your empire. Take care. Have a great day. Bye-bye.